What's up, Taiwan? I'm Joyce Sen with news from here in Taiwan and around the world. At least 60 people have been killed and over 140 injured following an armed attack on a concert hall in Moscow on Friday. Salienson reports. Bodies strewn across the ground. These are the scenes of chaos outside Moscow's burning Crocus City concert hall. People expecting a night's entertainment, instead witnesses to a night of horror. This armed group stormed the venue in the Russian capital, firing indiscriminately into crowds, first in the lobby, then in the concert hall itself. <laughs> Dozens are dead, over a hundred more injured. After the shooting, more terror as fire engulfed the roof of the complex. Russia's National Guard now searching for the perpetrators. An Afghanistan-based affiliate of the Islamic State says it's behind the attack. This just days after Russian President Vladimir Putin cemented his grip on power in an electoral landslide and over two years into Russia's invasion of Ukraine. U.S. officials say they warned their Russian counterparts that they had intelligence of an imminent terrorist attack, posting this warning on its Russian embassy website two weeks ago. Washington says its thoughts are with the victims. The images are just horrible um, and uh, just hard to watch, and our thoughts obviously are going to be with the, the victims of this terrible, terrible shooting attack. President Putin has also sent condolences but has yet to comment on the perpetrators. As Russia awakens to the deadliest attack on the country in years, the Kremlin will be left to answer how and why it happened. Justin Wu and Sally Jensen for Taiwan Plus. Seventy Rohingya refugees are presumed dead or missing after their boat capsized near the Indonesian coast. Indonesian Coast Guard and local fishing boats rescued 75 passengers on the boat, which departed from a refugee camp in Bangladesh. The Rohingya are a mostly Muslim ethnic group in Myanmar who have been forced to flee their homeland after years of persecution. Last year, nearly 600 Rohingya died or went missing while trying to escape Myanmar. New information has come to light about the suicide of a presidential office military guard. It reveals a dire shortage of manpower. The pressure is now on Taiwan's defense ministry to protect its officers. Grim new details about an armed military police officer who died by suicide earlier this month while guarding Taiwan's presidential office. Duty logs show that the private first-class surnamed Gu worked a grueling schedule that didn't include defense ministry mandated breaks for days in a row, leading up to his fatal self-inflicted gunshot. Some former officers are speaking up after the incident about what they had to endure to protect Taiwan's top office. As for Private First Class Gu, on one of the days leading up to his death, he worked six shifts. On other days, he had as few as two hours rest between shifts. Defense Ministry rules say officers should rest six hours between two-hour shifts. The ministry has admitted they are short on officers and says they're trying to find solutions. This isn't the first time a soldier has fatally injured himself while posted at the presidential office. In 2012, a private shot himself with his rifle at the front gate. With a change of presidents from Tsai Ing-wen to Lai Ching-te set for May, the pressures on the defense ministry to protect Taiwan's head of state and the people keeping them safe. 
Taiwan's economy ministry has announced electricity price hikes coming into effect in April. The hikes come as state-owned electricity supplier Tai Power reported a deficit of over 12 billion U.S. dollars at the end of 2023 and is projected to lose another 5 billion U.S. dollars this year. Electricity prices will increase between 3 to 10 percent for residential customers and between 7 to 25 percent for industrial customers to account for their higher consumption. Taiwan's central bank raised interest rates this week to a 15-year high. This will likely have a significant impact on consumer spending and people's mortgages. Wesley Lewis has the details. Taiwanese spenders may soon need to tighten their belts. The country's central bank this week raised the benchmark interest rate from 1.875 percent to 2 percent. The previous rate had stood unchanged since March last year. In February, the consumer price index reached 2.16 percent, surpassing the 2 percent inflation warning line. The bank said its interest rate hike is a response to this rise in prices. The rate hike to 2 percent is a new 15-year high and comes close on the heels of Japan's decision to raise its own interest rate for the first time since 2007. The average mortgage interest rate of major banks in Taiwan was around 2.1 percent before the hike. Now, if someone borrows around 300,000 U.S. dollars and takes 40 years to pay off the principal loan, the monthly mortgage will increase by a little over 20 U.S. dollars per month or slightly over 240 US dollars per year. The central bank says this week's interest rate hike will counteract an imminent rise in electricity prices, but its impact on people's everyday bills remains to be seen. John Su and Wesley Lewis for Taiwan Plus. Thousands of runners are in Taiwan's outlying islands for an annual marathon. A reporter, Bryn Thomas, is there to meet with the athletes braving rain and hills on a whopping 50-kilometer run. It's a dreary day here in Taiwan's outlying Mazu Islands, but this, that isn't stopping these athletes. Many of them flew in from Taipei yesterday, woke up early this morning, and have been racing for the last few hours. They're taking part in the annual Mazu Bagan Ultra Marathon, which is made up of several different races. One lap around the island is 12 and a half kilometers, two laps around the island is 25 kilometers, and four laps is a whopping 50 kilometers. Now it's this distance, these hills, and this weather that makes this marathon ultra. It's considered one of the hardest races on Earth. Uh, and I thought that that was even harder than the Taipei Marathon. I mean, 3,000 feet of elevation gain was just absolutely crazy. Now here at the finish line, most of the runners have completed the race and it really took a lot out of them. Now the main event, the 50 kilometer event, went to a Taiwanese runner named Li Zhechun who completed his race in 4 hours and 12 minutes. Now there can only be one champ, but just finishing this race is a big achievement. Ryan Wu and Bryn Thomas in the Mazu Islands for Taiwan Plus. The Kaohsiung city government is using 5G and augmented reality at its zoo. Irene Lin looks at how this new tech is letting people get up close with wildlife. Augmented reality is letting people get up close and personal with zoo animals. At this year's Smart City Expo in Taipei, a team from the southern city of Kaohsiung is using new tech to break barriers and establish the world's first smart zoo. Using AR glasses and 5G, zoo-goers can interact with animals digitally and learn more about them through educational games. Outside of the zoo, these technologies have more to offer and can be seen in art shows across the country. 
Kaohsiung's deputy mayor says the new applications deserve to be seen in more entertainment venues in the city. The Kaohsiung city government may be setting an example with this technology, and their presence at this year's Smart Expo may inspire other Taiwan cities, making them a little smarter. Justin Wu and Irene Lin for Taiwan Plus. A whale shark has been spotted in a rare sighting off Taiwan's east coast. A man noticed the large animal while out fishing on his boat in waters off Hualien County. He cut the engine and began taking this video, showing the docile whale shark circling the boat three times. Whale sharks are not whales, but actually the world's largest fish. They are an endangered species and are protected in Taiwan. Thai scientists are restoring one of their country's most diverse coral reefs. But despite success, they say there's only so much they can do in the face of changing climates. John Van Trieste has this story. It's late at night, and far down in the Gulf of Thailand, a team of scientists in scuba gear is busy at work. This is the one time of year when corals spawn in this part of the world. The site is mesmerizing. But the scientists have little time to appreciate the spectacle. In plastic boxes, they're collecting coral eggs and sperm. Rising sea temperatures brought by climate change have seriously damaged the coral here. And these scientists are working to save it, not only for the sake of the coral, but for the 25% of marine life that relies on it. Once the collection is done, it's back to a waiting boat to start the long process of making new coral, coral that will one day be put back into these waters. The mixing must happen straight away or there will be inbreeding. But after this, it's a matter of patience. For 72 hours, the scientists change the water regularly. Only then will the tiny emerging coral be ready for the next step, transfer onto earthenware tiles, where they'll grow for several years before they're big enough to be put back into the sea. Scientists have repeated this process year after year since this coral restoration project launched in 2016. Their work has restored around seven hectares of degraded coral, a little under half the total area of the local reefs. Along the way, they've learned a lot about conditions in the reefs and what's driving them. บริเวณแนวตื้อนะคะได้รับผลกระทบเป็นอย่างมากเลยค่ะเพราะว่าเนื่องจากว่าเป็นช่วงที่น้ํามันลดลงต่ําสุดทําให้แนวปะการังค่